You're listening to the Straight to Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Hey, how's it going? I hope you're all well and welcome to my show, Straight to Video. If this is your first time listening, welcome aboard. And if you enjoy the show, please consider checking out some of the earlier episodes because there's a lot of fun chats to catch up on. And today's talk is no different as I speak to guitarist and songwriter Clint Lowry of the band Seven Dust. I heard it on good word from my friend Jamie Delerick that Clint was a big 80s pop culture guy and it was really great to have him come on the show to talk all about growing up in North Carolina with his two brothers and all the early bands and music they discovered along the way whilst watching martial arts movies and lots of other fun stuff which he shares from his early career during our chat. Clint has a great solo album available now called God Bless the Renegades which also features the talents of Wolfgang Van Halen on drums and bass and Seven Dust will be out on tour in the US starting this March as part of their 21st anniversary anniversary tour. Before we dive into our chat, please show some love and support for our friends Dead Skull Coffee, who continue on their journey to bring you the finest ground and full bean rock and roll coffee in the UK, along with offering you all 15% off any order through their website, deadskullcoffee.co.uk. Simply use the discount code STV on checkout. Dead Skull Coffee have also just been announced as sponsors of the third stage at this year's Call of the Wild Festival at Lincolnshire Showground in May, which will be great to see them providing fresh coffee at this event. For full details of the lineup, check out callofthewildfestival.com. Okay, if you'd like to learn more about Clint and Seven Dust after our chat, then visit clintlowry.net or sevendust.com where you'll find all the info you need. But in the meantime, please enjoy my straight to video talk with Seven Dust guitarist and songwriter Clint Lowry. What's up? How you doing, man? You all right? I'm good. I'm good. How about yourself? Yeah, great. We finally did it. We got it hooked up. Yeah, man. Absolutely. I appreciate you doing this for us, Clint. Thank you ever so much. Oh, uh, my pleasure. How's things with you? You all good? I'm great, man. I'm just trying to survive in this weird world we live in. But yeah, it's been great, man. I have no complaints, really. Just working a lot, you know, staying busy in all these different ways than, than typical, you know. I saw you was also on um, Jarrett from Bowling for Soup's Rockstar Dad podcast as well. Yeah, yeah. I actually had a, a lot of fun with that. It was cool. You know, I got some funny Bowling for Soup stories from Butch Walker and had an association with them. And so I had like uh, always appreciated their sense of humor and uh it was cool. And and just from the dad's perspective and grown up and we're in, at this age now and having this, this dialogue with him and in a like-minded kind of uh, life dynamic. So it's kind of cool. I think they're quite a unique band, really, because they came around and obviously appealed to all the pop punk kids and stuff. But a lot of people from an older generation could see like, oh, these guys know their stuff from like the 80s and 90s and they could tell like the influences which was in there and it was great it's always funny to watch there was that age that you were where you're old enough to appreciate the old 80s 90s 80s stuff specifically but then you were still able to connect in this modern pop punk you know like you could take some of that information and kind of not make fun of it but you could just who who was it that did that a lot it was uh ah oh man uh it's the guy that was, he was married to Avril Lavigne. I'm having a- Oh, there's some 41 guy. Some 41. Thank you. That was it, yeah. <laughs> God dang. It comes to you eventually. It's like, you have to trace things back. It's like, here's me wanting to talk all about the 80s and stuff with you. So let's see how we get on. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, I love it. All day long, every day. So are you acting St. Louis? I'm in St. Louis, Missouri, yeah. I've been here for 12 years. But you're originally from North Carolina. Is it Fayetteville? Is that how you pronounce it? You can say Fayetteville, Fayetteville, Vietnam. Vietnam, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, well, there was a huge military army base there, and that was kind of a, a nickname that the town got. Vietnam. You know, anyone that's from there gets it because 82nd Airborne's there. And... Right. Okay. And I've heard you say in the past that you felt you never really fit in. Your dad was Native American, your mom a preacher's daughter. I would guess perhaps lots of very different traditions compared to how you were seeing maybe your friends were growing up, would you say? Yeah. I mean, you're talking about two completely different universes as far as culture on my mom's side and for my dad. I mean, it was all country, like very Southern but this different um different uh, approaches different beliefs more similarities than either one of them would like to admit right but being like this you know biracial kid where i had all these brown relatives and aunts and uncles very loving and then on my mom's side caucasians and it, I, it, it never occurred to me that there was really any much difference it was just every now and then i would hear specific little racist things said on one side or the other but i was always in the middle like i don't know my dad's brown my mom's white and they're human and <laughs> yeah so there's probably more of a clash with the family outside of your mom and dad than yeah i mean we and, and you know it's I always think it was a blessing to be born in into that because you automatically have a, a empathy and understanding that people blend and they fall in love and have, that is the last thing that you need to worry about or should divide yourselves with you know but that's what happens i guess you picked up on that pretty early as a child or is that something you've reflected on late it's like i had no idea this was going on because i was taking everything on face value so sort of it was an edge i think having or not at an edge. I was very lucky to have experienced these two different cultures. I took that along with me. But like you said, I reflected on that the older I got, the more I understood. I, and there was there like therapy that I've been through, different things that I've that have kind of peeled that onion back and let me realize, okay, that is that was a thing. That was interesting that I was you know, able to kind of grow up in those two dynamics. But it was also that I never fit in anywhere syndrome as well. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> like, well, I'm not exactly that. I'm not exactly that. I'm in the middle somewhere, you know. You're the middle of three brothers yourself though, right? Corey is the oldest and Dustin, I believe, four years younger than you. Mm -hmm. There's obviously been a huge bond between the three of you, not only as a family, but in a musical relationship as well over the years. Was that always the case? It was. Some of it competition, some of it just general support. Um, you know, relationships come and go, brothers. Sometimes we're super tight. Sometimes we don't speak for a long period of time. It just happens. And that's just being completely honest. Um, you know, I always support and love them and want the best for them. But um, the music has always been the bond naturally, but it's also been the curse where it puts somewhat of a wedge in between us because of the distance, because of the travel, because of the quest <laughs> to become, you know, a self-sustainable musician. And um, so, but we ha all have our individual families and my focus is my kids and my family and theirs are, you know, with them. So that's really what creates the distance most of the time. That four years between you and Dustin, it's quite a jump as you guys hit your teenage years. Was he always wanting to hang with you? Like? Yeah. So I was always, me and Corey, when I was old enough, I graduated a year early and went on tour with him. We spent a ball, lion's share of our beginnings together. My younger brother, actually, honestly, looking back, have more of a musical bond with him. But like you said, the four years was huge gap back then. So I wasn't, I wasn't really able to collaborate with him the way that I was with my older brother. But I saw things percussively and musically more like my younger brother. We really bonded in that way. And he's a killer singer and he can, he has cool melodies and writes really good lyrics. And his songwriting was actually more of something I connected with. What kind of things were you all into at a young age, which you could do together? Was there much to do in your town, like places to hang out? No, nah, man, we grew up in the middle of nowhere. Not very poor, but we had just enough. You know, heat would get turned off, you know, lots of things. But we went, we made the best of we were always outside. We obviously music was a huge thing, a lot of garage bands back then and going back and forth. There's a 
huge crop of musicians where we grew up in Fedville, which is crazy. A lot of them went on to do pretty big things. Anybody who we might have heard of? Yeah. Uh, well, like Troy McClawhorn, he plays for Evanescence. Bevan Davies was the drummer. He went on, he played with Jerry Cantrell and Glenn Danzig for a little while. He does some really cool Zeppelin tribute thing now, but it's like really good. Bunch of, there was a singer, Donnie Hamby, which we had, we're in a band, Still Rain. He did a band called Double Drive. And even Jimmy Herring, which is one of the best guitar players in the world, did lessons from Fedville. I don't know if he was born there, but he grew up in Fedville and was like the master, the Yoda of guitar. And if you know anything about Jimmy Herring, you know, he he's just incredible player. So a couple other people, but yeah, yeah. Something in the water down there. At that time. I mean, I don't really think there's been a lot of artists break out of there since, but there there were at, at that time some good musicians. But yeah, we were very in, much in martial art movies and Kung Fu and all the Bruce Lee and all that stuff. So we were always in the yard acting like we were going to kill each other. Which was the regular VHS rental. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, when that happened, when that world opened up, it was all martial art movies, Kid with a Golden Arm. There was a whole you know phase of those movies that were all the rage. But then we went and got the darker ones, too, like Faces of Death and you know, all these crazy old, old, scary movies, cheesy 80s horror flicks were a huge thing. And we have family value video. And then there was Blockbuster and all these other ones. Both your mom and dad were like very musical and even played in a band together. Was it Plant and See? Yeah. And this is what I think is super cool. I ask a lot of musicians what the album was that made them want to do music. But yours, I believe, is a record your parents made, right? I mean, that was like the first vinyl on the record player as a kid put the needle on that whole experience, which I think is just brilliant. Just having that curiosity, looking at the album cover, looking at all the crazy psychedelic artwork and then taking the album out, putting on there and having to put a quarter on top of the needle because it wasn't heavy enough, you know, and put it on there. It would skip and you would try to do whatever it is. And then you would listen. But that my mom and dad's record were and that and Jimi Hendrix, uh, Axis Bold and Love. Those were the two that I actually put on. There was a 45 of uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds that uh, blew my mind. That was one of the others that were laying around. How old was you at that point? Six. As far back as I can remember, my first memories of, of life were putting those records on. Is every note etched into your head, do you think? <laughs> yeah. I mean, especially uh, the Lucy in the Sky with Diamond riff in the beginning, that minor to major chord progression affected me and it imprinted in me something that would stick with me forever to this day. A lot of the other early music you would listen to, I say it was quite folk-based, I believe, maybe a bit of the Beatles, James Taylor. And then I think Perhaps like it was for a lot of young kids. It was for me when rock and heavy metal came around. It was pretty scary stuff. Oh, yeah. I don't know if it's like that for kids these days, but I remember the first time I had Metallica, I was like, Phew. I'm not sure about that. Do you recall the first band that had that effect on you? Come on now. I mean, I talk, you say Metallica, <laughs> that was nothing in terms of fear. Yeah. I had a friend, Joey Miller, and he would have all the newest metal records. And I'm talking about aggressive, Merciful Fate, King Diamond, Venom. All these like really, really gothic, like very terrifying, you know, Dio was there, but not nothing, you know, nothing too crazy outside of the dragons and mystics. But the first time I even put on, um, you know, hearing King Diamond sing, you know, there's merciful fate, don't break the oath. I mean, that was, it was about Satan. There was no ambiguous. It was you were going to burn in hell if you listen to these records. And I'm listening to it with headphones like now. I'm like, oh, my God. That was, yeah. I mean, all those early uh, metal bands were huge. Was that a big thing at school? Everybody was into it all at the same time? Or? Not everybody. And no. that, was the, that was the beauty. Not everybody. You were the rebel. You know, that was, it was punk rock and there was metal. Those were the very, the black sheep. The Bastard Children it was not popular music. And that's what was so beautiful about it was that it was, I got bullied a lot. I got a lot of, a lot of people didn't understand. I would play songs for girls. Like I'd play like these old metal songs, like, listen to this. And they're like, this is terrible. Like, <laughs> you don't have any idea what you're talking about. Would you like the, like the guy in Trick or Treat where he's got his denim jacket on and he's getting it. picked on? I love that movie. Went and saw it three times as a kid. It's a great film. I revisited it last Halloween and I'd not seen it for a few years. It's got to be terrible. I mean, it's got to be fast way. Yeah, yeah. Certain parts of it hold up surprisingly well. They really nail some, 
like the kid's character, I forget his name, but he plays it so well and it's so relatable. I got to watch it again. I, rem- I remember it being a big production. Like that was like, wow, man, trick or treat. Yeah, like hearing that kind of music, it's both kind of like a horror movie. It's scary, but it's cool as well. You're scared, but you want some more. It's like, it's dangerous. I shouldn't be listening to this, but I want more of it. Who were some of the first bands you really got into there? Was it that heavy stuff like King Diamond and Dio or who was kind of like your band? It started off with me, my best friend. This is how crazy it is. I moved into a neighborhood in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and my best friend was literally on the other side and his older brother was in a band called Prisoner. And I mean, it was just the likelihood of that happening. But I remember him saying, I want this, you know, as my first gift was we we're new best friends. I was nine years old. He's like, I want Diary of a Madman, Ozzy Osbourne record. And it just came out and I got my mom to buy it for him. And so like it was Ozzy and then it went to ACDC, which was actually ACDC was a little before that in the neighborhood prior, I remember being at a bus stop and a guy in a Trans Am pulling up and talking about back in black. And, you know, I'm like, oh my God. How crazy is that when someone, you only had to have like one cool person talk about something and he's like, I got to check it out. Yeah. Then I was confused because Brian Johnson was not the original singer. So I had to hear these other ACDC songs. And that was my thing. I'd find these bands three or four records into their career just with Ozzy, you know, Dire of Madman was the follow up to Blizzard of Oz and all these records. But um, I mean, there was all the basic metal, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, the British Invasion, that all that stuff was huge. And then there were the obvious uh, D.O.'s and Black Sabbath. That song, you know, what is this? This that that. <laughs> Looking at that album cover, it terrified me, man. It was like legitimately scared of the music. Where would you get your albums from when you're sending your mom to buy Diary of a Madman and all that kind of thing? There was a popular record store called the Record Bar in Fayetteville at a mall. Uh, there was a couple of standalone mom and pop places that I used to frequent years later, but record bar is where I would go generally to kind of find these albums. And they had all the t-shirts on the walls that were wrapped in a vinyl style. So you would go and buy the record and then try to find the shirt. They have posters there as well. Oh my Posters God. and patches. <laughs> posters, patches. I had contests with my best friend on who could cover every square inch of their wall with, you know, and it was awesome, man. It was a great time to be a kid. What was the first shirt you wore with pride? Uh, to be honest with you, it was... I would say it was Number of the Beast, Iron Maiden. How did that go down in the neighborhood? (laughs) Uh, You know what? I I actually wore a Speak of the Devil shirt, Ozzy, where he had the, he's on the throne. He's got vomit or like whatever that is. They called my mom to school and they were like, oh, this is very distraction. And my mom was a teacher as well, but she was really rebellious. She's like, well, yeah, it was no more distracted than these little, these girls walk around with super shorts or, you know, she was very like, but it was a pretty offensive shirt. (laughs) Did any bands come through town? Uh, it was There was an arena there. That, um, I saw my first concert was going to be Screaming for Vengeance, Judas Priest, but my older brother taught me out of it. But my first show was Def Leppard, Power Mania. And that was the, the second shirt I wore, the British flag shirt. And wearing that to school and then nobody having a clue. Like half the people hated it. Half the people thought it was the coolest thing in the world. It almost kind of borderlined on like a punk rock shirt as well, I guess, with it being the yeah. Union Jack and all that kind of thing. I was never cool enough to be in the punk rock world that was a whole different yeah how was that gig though it was great you know rick had both of his arms (laughs) (laughs) and uh you know what's just funny is i never i I always say i saw him but where i was sitting in the arena the drums were kind of tucked back so i never really actually saw him i heard him but i don't have like very glimpses of that concert i don't remember much about it i was very young but it was awesome. I remember the, the lights going down, the lighters, that first experience. I'm like, I want to do this, you know? Yeah. Who did you go with? Do you remember? Was there a bunch of you? Uh, there was a few of us. Um, my best friend, Joey Jakes, which I'm still friends with today. But um, there was a couple of the other uh, older boys, but we just stood in you know, our seats and just sat there and just Damn terrified. You know? <laughs> yeah. You remember who opened awesome. for him? Yes, I do. It was Gary Moore and Crocus. Nice. So Crocus was the first band you saw live, was it? Or was Gary Moore on first? Gary Moore was, he went on and I remember walking in and he was already on, but Crocus was actually technically the first band where the lights go off 
and the, the lighters and then Def Leppard, but Crocus was the one. And I, you know, I was into them. They were like a poor man's ACDC. Sweet. Was you even thinking about playing music at that point? Yeah, I thought, well, I, it was very new because I, I rebelled at first because my mom and dad were musicians and you never want to do what your mom and dad do at first. But um, yeah, we, we got quickly into it because again, the whole neighborhood was garage band. Everyone was trying to play music and but that was, I remember thinking like it was yesterday, like, this is what I want to do. You know, as corny as that is, but the lights go out. And... Was it like, I want to be Steve Clark. Was it that kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Steve was, he was awesome, man. It was really cool back then. But you wanted to be a drummer originally though, right? Yeah. I was a drummer through that, but wasn't able to get a drum set because we didn't have a lot of money. So my mom was able to get me a guitar instead, which I was already playing. So yeah, it worked out. But I was a I was a drummer at first. It was a Aria Pro Two, right? Where do you get all this information? That's, that's accurate. The, the internet's amazing. <laughs> but I think you mentioned you actually know who owns that guitar now, right? Yeah, I, I think they still have it. I would like to get it back. It was the thunder, you know, the, the lightning bolt, whatever. The, I guess the Explorer kind of shape, or whatever. But it was the, I, I mowed grass, you know, I mowed lawns for the guitar and bought it, put it on layaway and. It was pretty cool. Where did you get it from? Was it like a local music store? Yeah, it was this place called Nunnery and Bass. Walked in and I want to put this on layaway and put 20 bucks and they put it in the back and, you know, it was a whole thing. How were those first few months? Did you take lessons or was you learning from books or figuring out stuff from records? I played by ear. My dad, obviously my dad was a musician, so he, he never really taught me a lot. He would just kind of play and I'd watch him. My older brother was playing, so he was... He was there. There were a lot of people, but more more of anything, it was just holding the guitar and slowly just grinding. And then you hear things like, oh, I can kind of do that. And there were a couple guitar lessons in the beginning, but I didn't like it because I wanted to write my own stuff early, early on. You know, I, these are cool songs, but I want to do my own songs, you know. Who were some of your early guys? I, I think you mentioned like Steve Vai and Eddie Van Aliens come up in the past. Were they your guys or was there anybody else who you originally gravitated to? Oh, man, they were definitely the guys. I mean, all the shredders at that time, you know, I was inspired by all of them in a different way. Like I loved how simplistic ACDC, Angus Young and Malcolm Young were. Yet I love the progressive riffing of Iron Maiden and the harmonies. And Eddie Van Halen obviously was just a raw, just incredible talent, more exaggerated, yeah, more, yeah. more complex. Steve was another, just a heightened version of Eddie, but Eddie was cooler songwriter, but Steve was just more progressive player. So I loved all of it. I absorbed all of it. Stevie Ray Vaughan was a huge thing, you know, I, blues players, anyone that, that was a master of their craft. I just love just an endless pool back then of different styles. There's never one in particular. Anyone that says that there's one just feels limiting. To yeah, me. yeah. There's so many, so many good guitar players and bass players. Were you listening to Steve Vai before he even got the David Lee Roth gig? You're a fan of his flexible EP. I was, I was 16 or so when I, I like, I'm going to learn the attitude song and I always loved Steve Vai's quirkiness, but he was the most influential guitar player of my shred era. Mm -hmm. Like I was constantly playing guitar for hours and hours. Where did you first see him? Was it in a magazine or did someone say, you got to hear this record? Oh man. Um, I forget how he came on my radar, but it was before, it was before the David Lee Roth thing, but I actually saw him with David Lee Roth on the skyscraper tour. Oh wow. How was that? It was amazing, man. But the only thing that was bummed me out, Billy Sheehan was not the bass player. He had just left. The drummer's brother was actually playing bass, but it was still an incredible show. Did he have the heart-shaped guitar, Steve, on that tour? He did. I mean, the Just Like Paradise, that, that you know, he had that. He busted that out, did an incredible guitar solo. And You've met and played with Steve, though, right? Almost in a I have. Ralph Macchio crossroads scenario. <laughs> yeah, like the most intimidating scenario. And it... It unfolded in a way. Had you told me that that was the way it was going to play out, I probably would never have had the balls to get on the stage. But he was like, oh, we'll get up here. We'll improv. We'll come up with a song. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> and then we're ended up, we're soloing. And I'm like going back and forth with him, like face to face. And I had like one lick that kind of hung with him. But then it was just like he toyed with me. You know, he was just like incredible. It was, it was a bucket list to sit and play with for a second. It was amazing. Sweet. Have you seen that new Hydra guitar he's got coming out? I saw that last night. I was like, yeah. damn. <laughs> I am like, that is an ambitious project, man. I, and Steve Vai is very kind and, and amazing. And 
to be able to meet him. And I don't like to bug him a lot, you know? Um, but when I do try to interact with him, he's always nice and patient and yeah, that guitar is incredible. I still actually, after this, I'm going to YouTube a little bit more about it because I, I, I got to get one. Like it, It's incredible. There's a freaking bass on there. Part of it's fretless, all kinds of stuff. It's nuts. It, and it doesn't surprise me coming from him. Yeah. And you met Eddie Van Halen too. You put a really cool post up when he passed saying that meant a real lot to you because I think you said you were in a pretty dark place and he really lifted you up. So meeting your hero and him yeah. giving you that is pretty awesome. When was that? Was that... What tour would he have been on at that point? He was touring. Uh, it was the first reunion uh, with Sammy Hagar back in 2004. And I'm looking at the picture right now. But um, yeah, it was like meeting that guy uh, at a time. It was kind of like I was trying to get sober and trying to do all this. And he was in a kind of a bad way at the time. Yeah. But he was still Eddie Van Halen. And uh, he was so nice. And he wasn't always nice to everybody. But for some reason, the way that got the guy that introduced us gave like a little backstory on me and said, this is the guy from Seven Us. He's kind of, you know, he's got a clue. He gets the riffs. He knows the deal. And like kind of vouch for me. Yeah, yeah. I walked in this little dressing room in Louisville, Kentucky, and he's just in there warming up, playing guitar and, you know, getting ready. And he's got a bottle of wine. And it was really wild. But he was nice to me. And I got to go on stage. I was like right there like in his guitar world and he's talking between songs then i met him years later through woofy good friend of mine when he was in a way better place and he was still cool yeah still funny still kind of like hey man dave talks a lot you know (laughs) and uh, i just like it was just crazy you know they're just human beings you know and when you look at someone like that that's so influential it's very difficult to have a really it's awkward for them because he can see in my eyes the admiration, feel the energy, the nervous energy, because you're like, I, I just don't know how to talk to you like a normal person. You are so much to me. But he had a way of like, get over that. Let's just hang. You know, let's just talk. He always came across that way in interviews is like totally different for everything he's done. Like someone like David Lee Roth lives up to the, yeah. the spectacle and the yeah. persona, whereas Eddie was totally different. I've always said like, I'd always heard the name Eddie Van Halen. And then when I saw a picture of him, I was like, that's Eddie Van Halen. He didn't kind of match up to what this huge thing is. And that also ran through in his personality as well from what I could see, which I always thought was a cool counterbalance to it all. Well, it depends on what picture you saw. He was just sat down with his guitar and I was like, it's just like a normal guy. He was. Where you'd seen pictures of Steve Vai, all stuff hanging off him and all kinds of things. It was very much the character. I, I, I totally understand. I think that was a cool thing about Eddie was he was just a badass, you know? He was just a killer guitar player, very inventive and but relatable so cool that you've become friends with Wolfgang too and he was on your solo album God Bless the Renegades on the drums and bass crazy bass player man it's like I'm the biggest Michael Anthony fan but when you hear Wolfgang's playing it's insane yeah and uh, you know poor Wolf's got a lot of you know the the Van Halen you know fan base it's very difficult I think he handles it the best way he can but man Wolfie is a master musician and I don't give a shit what anyone says. Michael Anthony's incredible, but Woofy to me is is in his own right. You got to think about Michael Anthony had the Van Halen brothers on both sides of him. So all he had to do was just keep up, you know, anybody in that <laughs> position. And Michael had a personality and that voice. So his his ingredient was crucial. I understand. But what if Woofy would have been from the beginning? You know, had he been in Van Halen from the beginning at that age, you know, he would have, you know, he's showing now. He can rise to the occasion. He's going to do some cool stuff. What well, can you tell us how it was in your very first bands? I think Sirius was your first, but I've seen the names Satin Dagger, Quiet Thunder, and the appropriate track, Give Him Thunder, which is awesome. I found that on YouTube, man. That's great. You saw the song and everything? Oh, my God. Yeah, the, the songs of that. It's yeah. awesome. It's so corny. I, and <laughs> it's great, though. I, I listen to it with pride still. Like It it doesn't bother me. Like People are like, oh, are you embarrassed? I'm like, absolutely not. I was 16 years oh, old. Oh, hell no. And we were so prime and ready. When we went in the studio, Like we did, we only had two or three days to do four songs and we prepared like we got our solos together and i mean we really woodshed it so i listened back to that i'm like man that was so cool you can feel the fun and the vibe where did you record it we recorded it in a place called fuke wave arena a studio there somewhere tucked away and uh, it was the first time we had saw tape machines and 
we were able to double vocals and all these things and just really um, confirm that it's what we wanted to do. And there was like studio tricks. We don't have to nail it the first time. We can actually punch it in. You had to be ready though going in back then. It's like, yeah, yeah. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a joke and it was expensive. Like you say, a lot of musicians came out of that area. Was there quite a local scene? Was it bars or was there any clubs you could play at? There was a couple of clubs. So another one that Sully from Godsmack, his mom relocated from Boston to Fedville. He was a drummer in his, all these metal bands. He was another guy that was in that same little scene. But there was a place called Docks and it was the local bar, local club that bands got their start in and tons of really good shows there. You know, that's where you cut your teeth. That's where you would all compete. And I think that was the beauty then because everyone wanted to do this. Sh- they had like one show every three months or so. And you were wanting to do the best. You rehearse and rehearse, rehearse. And then you get a bunch of people come out and give you a chance. And if you don't do well, the you kind of fall off. So it was a really highly competitive scene. You work with him, obviously, later on, and we mentioned him earlier, but did you ever cross paths with Butch Walker and anything he was doing then? Or had he relocated to the West Coast at that time? Because it's not a million miles away from where he was. No, no. He was uh, he was in South Gang. My band, Still Rain, opened up for South Gang. It was my first introduction to Butch. So me and him are both holding our guitars face-to-face, like at Soundcheck, not plugged in, just kind of walking around the venue with our guitars, like shredding. Like He's like, I'm like, what's up? He's like, what's up, man? <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, he's like fucking shredding, you know, Butch was always great. And then he was like, you know, over the top and I, I was competitive with him, but knew he was better. And so that was my first introduction to him and just loved everything he did. He became a singer. He was all, he did all the things I wanted to do. I wanted to be a singer. He became a really great singer. Then he became this great producer and still made this credible music. And then he worked with all these bands. And so he was, I just have a ton of admiration for Butch, man. And I had the most fun I've ever had making a record when, when we did the record with him. Him and I laughed nonstop just about old 80s stuff and just the ridiculousness of it all but how awesome it was you know and all just like 80s you know me and him just laughing so hard it was fantastic how was it for you when like the early 90s rolled around i guess you would have been out with the band still rain with your brother like fresh out of high school playing hundreds of shows a year then all of a sudden there's this big musical movement how did that affect you as a musician and guitar player was that exciting for you it was I fell in love with all the Soundgarden and Nirvana and all the Nirvana took me a second, but I really fell in love with them later. But there was this huge movement in terms of sound. And I mean, an entire shift in what was popular. We were right there young enough to grasp it. I remember one of the first shows we were playing like, in the, you know, covers and doing the typical songs. And then this isn't the grungy thing, but this is more for like when Green Day was coming out. So we were playing at this place called The Station in Orlando. Long story short, they're like, well, we're going to do a matinee show, a punk rock show, and you guys got to move your gear out. This band Green Day is going to come in and play, and after they leave, we'll set up. You can play the show tonight. Like, oh, Green Day, whatever. So they pull up in their their little van, like total little bookworm van that they first toured in, and we're like, what the hell is this? They get on stage the entire club, this is completely packed, ass to elbow. They had the buzz going, so all these people rushing out to see him. They freaked out. I remember Billy's guitar sound was, I'm like, this is the best Marshall. I mean, the famous Marshall. Anyway, seeing that and what we were doing, like, man, we are not relevant. Like, this is a whole new era. And then it was the Sound Gardens and all these bands that we just, so it opened up musically. It really charged us. We fell in love with it. We were a cover band just absorbing, but we had become an original band playing the cover band circuit at that time, which was unheard of. But yeah, it influenced us heavily. And I've heard someone say, whatever you're listening to from 18 to 24 is really your generally your music, like the imprint of who you are. And obviously you can grow and evolve, but it makes sense because I was highly influenced by 16 to 24, 25. Like I say you're just young enough to get excited by it, be out there playing with it. But all of a sudden it's like, holy shit, I want part of this. You're becoming an adult. You're like finding your groove in life. Yeah, it's crazy. The music is attached to that, all those experiences. Kind of in closing, if I may, you mentioned on Facebook about being a fan of 80s montage scenes. You teased, but then debunked doing some music in that style. Do you have any particular favorite soundtracks? I mean, dude, let me tell you something. I love 80s montage music. I have a whole playlist of songs in Spotify, and it's all the 
you gotta fight to survive all, all those <laughs> and i listen to them and they're, they're like they're incredible hearts on fire that uh, there's like a there's something that happens to me when i listen to those songs man it's like hearts on fire when that intro kicks in it's like dang yeah, there's like a cool chord progression and stuff it's legitimate i love it with all my heart and i do i do at some point i feel like my true calling is doing humor based comedy records there is no way maybe i could do it with butch because butch has the perfect brain for that like i don't know if he would want to do that in his career but if he ever wanted to do a joke 80s record just serious enough with like just just with a little wink absolutely <laughs> but like i'm i'm talking about taking it deadly serious but it would still be like humorous because when you nail it, because I'm from that era, it wouldn't be hard to re-pull those old skills out, you know. But I, I think I really want to do it just in, in EP at least, just four or five songs that are just like crazy 80s metal, you know. Have you seen the um the re-edit of Rocky Four, the director's no. cut yet? I want I want to watch it. Is it super long now? Like I think he's added about 20 minutes to it, but I think people say like the perception of it, it gives you a whole different view on the film, which I'm like, well, Rocky Four is pretty perfect. Me and my friend joke that so much happened within 90 minutes it's unbelievable it feels like a two and a half hour movie in the best way my son watched that movie i loved watching his reaction because i'm like watch this i was gonna ask that <laughs> he's like oh my god drago i'm like you don't even have any idea how this affected me when i was a kid man i mean i was terrified of drago man like oh it's a beautiful film so that was the first rocky film i even saw okay that was my in at the cinema and people are standing up and cheering i'm like what is going off if i can change you can change <laughs> it was the best man i was like yes if I had to pick, I always say the choice between soundtracks, which is the best, Rocky Four or Top Gun, and I'm kind of mm. stuck in between. I go, I think I go for Rocky Four. Hearts on Fire, that's in that, right? What was the other one when he's driving around? No Easy Way Out, Robert Tepper. Ah, there's no easy way out. <laughs> and my little bit of hair metal trivia, you know, remember the song Sweetest Victory? That's actually Mark Torian from the Bullet Boys singing on that song. Are you serious? Yeah, it's um, listed as a band called Touch, but um, someone says, you do know that's Mark Torian from Bullet Boys, right? I'm like, no. Get out of here. Oh, my God. But once you know, you can never unhear it. I love it. I'm going to listen to it today. Set you up for the day. Sweet, Clint. Thanks ever so much for doing this for us. Always great to talk to somebody who loves all that kind of stuff. And I look forward to the montage EP in 18 months' time. Get Butch on the phone. I will. I will. He'll, he'll love it. Thank you so much, man. Massive thank you to Clint Lowry of Seven Dust for taking some time to chat with me here on the Straight to Video podcast. Loved hearing all about his passion and love for all things 80s and all the cool stories of his early gigs and bands. I really appreciated it and hope you enjoyed hearing about it too. For more info on Clint and his solo record God Bless the Renegades, then visit clintlowry.net. And Clint also has a great Patreon page too, which offers pledges insight into songwriting, demos, and also fitness information too, so lots going off over at patreon.com forward slash clintlowry if you wanted to check that out. Speaking of Patreon, I'd love it if you'd consider checking out the Straight to Video Patreon page, which goes a long, long way into the growth of this show. For a small monthly donation, you get behind-the-scenes access, a bonus podcast, and even exclusive merch, all of which can be found at patreon.com forward slash stvpod. And thanks, as always, to everyone who continues to support the show over there. All right, that is all for another episode of this show. I hope you all enjoyed listening and will continue to follow wherever you listen to podcasts. But in the meantime, thanks so much for checking in and I look forward to chatting again real soon. 